Yeah. Okay, I'm going to play something really stupid. <laughs> so this is how uh, well, my uh, documentary filmmaking works. Let's see if the sound's working. So in my documentary, Lost New, a Fallout Snow Globe road trip, I go to places in Las Vegas I inspired what's in the game. But then again, there are places in the game that remind me of real life places in Las Vegas. You know where in Las Vegas I'm reminded of when it comes to Sunset Sarsaparilla? done by one guy, me. Matt, sometimes they don't want you to bring technology to reality. <laughs> Too bad. Hello, Comic-Con. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, uh, like everyone yes, everyone's favorite experimental uh, panel. There's nothing... You know, if we can bring video games to reality, we'll consider it. And this is well, just how we do it. That we did this last November at the special edition show, and we got some new things here. My name is Mountaineer Moderator, I'm Axel, that guy with the Game Boy Camera Show. I walk around with a Game Boy Camera because I'm bored. <laughs> yeah, you, you wait around at cons, you, uh, you try not to buy it, you try, and, you try and pass the time, so I take photos with the Game Boy Camera. I know, this is from 1998, people forgot about it. Okay, but enough about that. Uh, so some time ago, I made a documentary called Lost New, a Fallout Snow Globe Road Trip, uh, based on the two times when I went to Las Vegas, and well, because it inspired the game Fallout New Vegas, and I do a road trip that's driven by these snow globe collectibles in the game. Yeah, I pretty much get make these snow globes and leave them in real life locations. I talked a lot about that last time. So let's, okay, let's talk about my uh, current uh, project that I try to do from time to time. I call it Bobble Get. Are you all familiar with the Fallout games? Yeah. All right, so there's, in the Fallout games, uh, 3, 4, 76, they all have these bobbleheads you can just find on the side and they increase your stats. All right, well, I always want to go to Washington, D.C., but that's been difficult in the last couple of years. So instead, I just decided, you know what? Any city can have bobbleheads. So I go from city to city and just leave bobbleheads for people to find. Yeah, so that guy with the Game Boy camera, the, one of the few times I don't post Game Boy camera or PST video, you know, posts. Yeah, so the point of, so in Bobble Get it, it gets me going to cities. I put bobbleheads in, you know, major cities so far, San Diego, Los Angeles, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, San Francisco, and at uh, one time I had an event called Wasteland Weekend. Uh, yeah. And with more cities to come. Alright, so these bobbleheads, I used to make them out of paper, with paper craft files, but and no one really talks about paper craft much. It's all about 3D printing now. Uh, so these files you can find for free on a website called Thingiverse. There's also printables, there's also my mini factory. And uh, 
That's it. So you get these files, slice them, stick them in your printer, and you got bobbleheads. Yeah, does it is it worth it in the long run? Yeah, probably. Otherwise, you got to pay like oh, maybe twenty five hundred dollars to a licensed retailer of bobbleheads, or two hundred fifty dollars to a licensed retailer to, for like twenty bobbleheads. And you have a three D printer, which is always fun. So yeah, paint these bobbleheads, assemble them, and yep. And I go for twenty in a city. All right, and uh, as you can see here, uh, my I'm in Los Angeles. You got. The story got picked up on uh, uh, gaming file. Yeah, that was pretty cool. A lot of great results from it. Yeah. So, how are you going to make a ball head? I have the licensed ones. Uh, like I said, 3D printing with acrylic paint. I recommend a CR10. It's a 3D printer. And there are probably paper craft templates out there. Or they've probably been all deleted by now. Uh, needle felting, play doh, clay, perler beads, and yeah, like this guy. Yeah, you get perler beads, you iron them, yeah, you put it against the template. Yeah, so I keep getting press coverage whenever I do this. Yeah. So I put these bobblehead trips on uh, Reddit, every Twitter, Facebook, my Twitter, my, my Instagram, and I make a YouTube video about it. And, uh, so yeah, the, the Phoenix trip, that was featured on Game Rant. I, I got it featured there because I went through uh, uh, Kotaku's list of uh, journalists. They have like a contact list. And you can just email all of them. Well, one of them, yeah, apparently put the, uh, the Phoenix bobblehead thing there. So yeah, and then this one uh, to the right. Uh, Fallout fan starts real world scavenger hunt in, uh, yeah, that was in, in San Francisco. That was two months ago. Yeah, that was fun. I just, my schedule opened up and I just did it. People love to find them, don't they? Yes, they do. Yeah, I, like to, I like when people find these things. Yeah, I, I, I like to read the comments on uh, on Reddit because, you know, with, with these hot girl posts, I, I know what their comments are going to be like. Oh, so cute. Oh, but bobblehead posts on Reddit, oh, they make people go nuts. And, uh, but here's the thing, you know, I... When I made that post on Reddit about my bobbleheads going to San Francisco, half of them were just, dude, you're littering. It's, uh, I know. That's what they do in the game, isn't it? Well, is it by de littering by definition? Yes. But we have issues with littering because it's ugly, it, it affects the environment, it affects our drinking water, maybe our health. This isn't doing that. This is not... No, this isn't affecting anyone's health or making things ugly. That's just one bobblehead spaced out by miles. How's that affecting you? It's geocaching. It's making. Uh, I guess it's collectibles in the real world. Yes. What you see in a game. So you now you can run around. Now you can find an IRL. It's yeah. all thanks to that guy with the Game Boy camera. <laughs> uh, five times so far. Well, fourth time. You know, after creating an Instagram account. No more, more cities to come. We'll do, I'll do Washington someday this year. I'll just say that. You'll be by surprise. Okay. So, yeah. Some of the community feedback? Oh, yeah. I, I get photos of people finding them. They, they don't get off sound. Anyone? I'm also making a sequel to my documentary, Lost New Way Fallout Snowboard Road Trip. Yeah, I sent it to Film for, Threat for review. Yeah, the guy. And he was he was a Fallout Three biased guy, but it but it got me inspired to make me, you know, a sequel. Figured since I did the road trip, showed all the locations, you know, it's pretty much that driving scene from Manos, The Hands of Fate, a lot of it without the soundtrack. Figured since I did all the driving, let's talk about Fallout more. And I uh, I got uh, this is bald that bald guy that's Einon Zur. He was uh, I got an interview with him. So of course, if I make the put the movie out, I got to run it by him and his publicist. I got a few. I got a minute with Danny Trejo, and uh, I recently spoke to Keith Zarabaka. Uh, how do you get people to be in your documentary? Uh, you look at their contact information. You see if they're with an agency. Sometimes they'll get back to you. Other times they'll be like they're making a movie. They're out of the country. And they got to turn it down. I spent months trying to get Matthew Perry, who does Benny, but. Uh, uh, yeah, he, he's, he's busy too, so, 
All right. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I like to read these comments I get. Uh, this this person on a Facebook group uh, wrote a really heartfelt comment about what it was like finding the uh, what was it lockpick one at the Mystery Castle in uh, in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah, driving the Phoenix is more fun than Phoenix. All right. Uh, any suggestions for cities besides DC? Fresno. Not Fresno. I passed it. <laughs> and, and also, also, I'd like to definitely. Add, I'd like to add, Max, is that like, it like when you get that collectible in the game, you have like that great emotional swell feel. That's what Max is actually doing mm -hmm. in IRL because you're finding it. It is making part of the actual treasure yeah. hunt uh, and, and getting that exact same feel that you would have from the games. Very. Yeah, people say geocache these, but uh, I want I want them to be to be out in the public, like in the game. You just see it there. Geocaching, you put it in a box. No, that's not how I I I want it, I want them, to, want them to be in plain sight. And of course, uh, I take inspiration from a guy named Invader. I went to his uh, art exhibit, and one of his Invader pieces is uh, still in downtown San Diego. If you don't know who Invader is, he's a French artist who puts space invaders all over the world, and he did, and so far he's done 4,000 pieces all over the world, including 20 or so in uh, this city uh, 10 years ago. Why space invaders, and is there a parallel? Well, let's see, freeing space invaders. Yeah, he's freeing the space invaders, like how I'm freeing the bobbleheads. You don't get the bobbleheads, you can get the bobbleheads in real life now, when I go to, when I go to your city. Yeah, he's, this is just, yeah, it's like a game to him, and he's always increasing his high score. All right, well, my high score is each city I do, so I've done 100 bobbleheads so far, and a platinum chip, and yes, Sunnyvale is where the platinum chip in New Vegas is made, so I left one there. Yeah, some guy on Reddit found it. He was grateful. He didn't call me out on littering. He's just going, he's just going home for a, for a platinum chip. Space Invaders, perfect icons of our time. Yes, the vintage video game character. But I believe Vault Boy is an icon of our time. He represents, yes, he's like a corporate mascot. And uh, yeah, we see a lot of those. So yeah, maybe we can get a, when Fallout shelters become real, who will be the real Fallout shelter in this world? But that's not affiliated with Bethesda. Yeah, so he makes these out of uh, Rubik's cubes and puts them on, let's use cement glue. I like the concept, yeah, he likes the concept of decontextualizing art to bring it to the streets, surprise everyday people. Well, I'm doing that with ball heads and snow globes, and uh, even my documentary, yeah, yeah, I got like 180 YouTube subscribers, but I want people to find it over time. I, I know cult classics don't start as cult classics, but I believe it can be by design. But of course, whenever I post about bobbleheads, someone's got to bring this up. Remember the Moon and Night Panic from uh, 2007? Yeah, the Aqu so it was part of a promotion for the Aqua Teen Hunger Force movie. But uh, with these LED fixtures of the Moon and Night characters, uh, well, they have components similar to IEDs in, in this post 9 11 world, uh, see something, say something. Well, that got the bomb squad in and shut down Boston for a day. Yes, the. Uh, the charges against the artists, one of them was named Zebler, I uh, think they were dropped and they did community service and the Tur Turner Broadcasting had to reach a settlement. Uh, but really, uh, but, but that led to a change in uh, Adult Swim, even getting a new president and more live action shows. I tried to contact Zebler through his email and the uh, university, and I think he works at Boston, or New York, at one of those universities. Yeah, they haven't gotten back to me. Okay, well, that's enough about me. Let's talk to Gabriel Valentin, Digital Lizard of the Week. Hey, that's me. Hi, guys. How's it going? Yeah. All right, so talk about your uh, video game-inspired graphic novels and even your music. Uh, yeah, so I am doing my best job to not grow up. That's everything I want to do. So, I grew up reading comic books and playing video games, uh, a lot of RPGs, and so as I got older, I was like, you know, I really don't like real life. So um, 
now I make a graphic novel series called Digital Wizards of Doom, and uh, it's all about an ancient pineapple demon that traps a bunch of characters, a bunch of heroes from another dimension inside a video game simulated universe and without their knowledge. So each book is referred to as a level. Uh, I actually have level two here, but uh, so it goes level one all the way through level eight, which would be the final boss. And uh, as you can see, the book is, every page, we try to do this on every page, is maybe an homage to our favorite movies, comic books, uh, video games, all that stuff. And the book is done in this emoticon text message format to simulate more of uh, the reader being a part of the story rather than just a fly on the wall. Um, and there's tons of Easter eggs in every page and references to other games. We've got a D20 over there. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot of hidden messages. So just trying to capture that spirit of you know, when you play Pokemon for the first time and you read all these things online about secret Pokemon and where to find them and looking under rocks and looking for clues. Just trying to recreate that that spirit and that joy you had when you were a kid. And does anyone know on the far right what that page is a reference to? What was that? You got it. Yeah. So you get a free book. There you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah, there's a uh, the middle page, that's Pineapple P. He's an ancient pineapple demon. He's, uh, he's a son of a gun, slippery son of a gun. He's trapped all these characters in that world, and as you can see, he's obsessed with pop culture. And so he just collects things from a bunch of different universes, and a lot of those things happen to be Marvel universe. World building is really important to me. That was my favorite part about RPG games and the adventure you went on in the world. And so I try to make sure that everything is consistent. The artwork, uh, if you can notice a little bit, it's, it changes each book. That's because I have a Pete. Anytime the, the characters get a sense that they're trapped in a video game, I have a Pete will change the graphics card, as we call it. So we switch artists for every book. Um, to simulate him resetting the game, and I, I kind of have like a timeline for each book, like an alternate timeline, and you kind of mess around with what happens to those versions of the characters, but it gets kind of dark, so this is definitely a young adult book, so don't go there, but all the planets up there, every planet in the book series has its own language, it has its own history, it has its own uh, solar system, and I use that to make sure that everything in the book series, all the books, stays consistent and is fun, and Easter eggs make sense, and the references make sense, and then hopefully when all the books are finished and published and, and out and available, uh, I would like to make a book that connects every single dot to the entire series. It's kind of like a guide or a, like remember those old like encyclopedia books like the Star Wars encyclopedias and stuff that you could get as a kid. Kind to make something like that that can tie into every single book, every single story. Um, yes, Pineapple P. Like I said, he's evil. Um, but he has this company called Pineapple Pete's Pineapples, the best pineapples in the galaxy. And he has spread his evil to not only this dimension that he trapped these characters in, but also other dimensions. So in the book, there's a lot of references that he sent out these signals to other dimensions, other universes. And although our universe is never mentioned, uh, he has influenced some things in our universe. Which is why, if you look up Digital Legends of Doom on Spotify or Apple Music, you will see music that he has released uh, in our universe. Um, and that's real, that's like not in the book, that's, that's like you can actually do it. And, um, but yeah, every single page, we try to make sure that there's some, something that ties into the pop culture world and it just pays, um, pays tribute to these great stories that have inspired so many of our favorite things.
All right, so Gabe, after years of hard work, you finally have a video game deal. Yes, we just got a video game deal with uh, Yonder Media Mobile. We will be developing three Digital Lizards of Doom video games. One is a beat, uh, I, mean, I always mess this up, rhythm fighter, okay? Um, one's a rhythm fighter, one's an RPG, and one is an action adventure game. So, I'm, uh, this, I've never helped develop a video game before, luckily that's not my job, I'm just going to be a consultant, and they purchased the uh, rights to use the characters and the lore and the story. So that's been pretty cool, and um, yeah, here's some of this stuff, early, early conceptual artwork that we're working on. Uh, for the video game, and there's talks, these little 8 bit looking characters. There's talks of making a physical Giga Pet, uh, so a little virtual pet game, which I think would be pretty fun because uh, all the characters are kind of weird. It would be really funny to, to feed a robot pineapples out of it, it just makes me laugh for some reason. But. Uh, so, one of those Tamagotchi pets feeding pineapples. That's right up here, I too. Okay, and, uh, and you also you have, a, well, you have an animated series. Well, we don't have an animated yeah. series, but uh, I'm working on an animated series right now. Um, Dallas McLaughlin, uh, you guys might know him from the Uncle Bat Super Show or Yo Gabba Gabba. He recently signed on as a showrunner for uh, the Digital Legends of Doom animated series. So it's in development. Uh, we don't have a studio at the moment, but we uh, just finished up season one, like the outline of it and how everything's going to work, and uh, if that doesn't work, then I'll keep making more books, and if that doesn't work, then I'll keep making more video games, and we'll see what happens. So Maybe be blessed by pineapple people. Yeah, maybe pineapple people come down and do something cool. Okay, you got a favorite animator, studio you'd like to, this to be with? Oh, man. I know. Nickelodeon? Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon would be yeah. cool. We, we have a meeting with Nickelodeon. Coming up uh, through Dallas, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't want to ruin anybody else. So I do have one in my head. But I, you know, okay, so would you make it a kids show or something that's on a Adult Swim? It would definitely be a kids show. Okay, uh, in the vein of like Adventure Time, uh, Steven Universe, or something like that. Oh, that's that's true. Yeah, we could do it. I. I would love it at Netflix, that'd be fun. Netflix, Paramount. Yeah. I don't like the Daily Wires having come on with what kids do. Daily Wires? Yeah. I gotta give you more books, man. You have like all the, the good yeah. ideas. They're publishing health books. Oh, man. We should talk afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for letting me know that. That's awesome. All right, well, thanks for telling us about Digital Lizards of Doom. Now, listen to his music. He's got a graphic novel. All right, thanks. Thank you. All right, next up, Lawrence Brenner. Hi, I'm Lawrence Brenner. I'm a comics and pop culture historian. I've been here for the past 10 years. My specialty is documentation of comics and pop culture, especially with creators and socialists, including multiple things here this weekend. So you may be seeing panels of anything from the Latina superhero industry to uh, even some of the basis of our erotic comics, which is actually a very surprising topic, as well as many others. I am a voice actor for video games, commercials, anime, animation, etc. I'm the engineer for Sunny Straight, who you may be familiar with as Krillin and Usopp and many other characters across Crunchyroll. I'm also a cosplayer, photographer, videographer, and an illustrator. I do a lot, as you can see, from my various badges, photography, my home studio setup, and then a picture of me in my home studio setup. Okay, so as this to IRL, this was uh, re used recently to help reconstruct Notre Dame. Yeah, now what's actually interesting is that when you're seeing things that they're taking actual physical locations and they're turning them into video game assets to be used for such things as levels or other such things, even for background information or even inspiration. You see this actually done with certain things like Breath of the Wild, where they have like the entire map of Japanese city and turn that into the basis for what became the world of Breath of the Wild. So, now, you can see that when Notre Dame actually was damaged, because the Assassin's Creed people had actually modeled everything, there was elements they could actually use to help in the reconstruction, because they don't always have those particular physical models, or the blueprints, or things of that nature. 
so that you can actually use these to help preserve it. Now, if you hit up the next slide, Max, it, it isn't able to fully rebuild everything, but it is able to provide some insight for how to do it. Now, the thing is, when you're using assets, is that they will tweak things to make things for gameplay, accessibility, etc. To most of our knowledge, generally assassination did not occur from the rafters and down inside Notre Dame. Though if we have anyone who's actually done that, please let us know. <laughs> All right, so next up, let's talk about more about AR and VR. Uh, hold on, let me, I got a surprise for you. I just exit out of this. Oh? Uh, yes. So, uh, augmented reality apps, uh, they, you can make them for iPhone and Android. In fact, uh, you can make them for, well, you, for, for Apple, iOS, uh, they're going to ask for a, uh, like a recording of your, a screen recording of your augmented reality app in action. So this is, uh, okay, so this is something I had to send to Apple to get my uh, augmented reality app approved. It's for a museum in uh, Chula Vista about the Holocaust. I worked with the curator, and uh, so this is how my app works. You open it up. Okay, we're in the museum in Chula Vista. Okay, what do you do when you hover over a certain imagery? Get information. That's one way, one thing you can do in augmented reality apps. What's that? Yes, some people are bothered by all the kids on their phones. I see it as an opportunity. So yes. Uh, and this becomes very important because it will allow you to provide additional contextual information in terms of the overlay that you can actually see. Usually this is done in gamification, which I'll be talking about in a moment, but this will actually allow you to get the additional information that you can see from an initial scan or something like that. And the beauty with such things as AR and VR, especially in this instance, is that it can be translated to whatever your local language is. So this would mean that people who don't necessarily speak English could actually easily view the stuff and then go right into it so they can learn what they need to learn from a museum. And there's so many different applications and allowing this to be implemented across other various mediums, such as the identification of toxic plants, animals, and all sorts of things, including even reading street signs as well as interpretations of possibly local laws. It ends up a very unique and very helpful aspect. Good. Yeah, I can actually see this in comic books. Actually, in Back when the 3DS was around, there were like these augmented, the 3DS actually had aug augmented reality. You know, they actually hover over cards and you had those dancing 3D graphics. I can, I can actually see an augmented reality uh, with, com with comic books. Uh, so far I did it with my mother's book, which was a part of the app in the museum. And yeah, so, open an app, it's it, open the augmented reality app for Digital Lizard of Doom, the app, and uh, over over this, you get information, you get Gabe's commentary. I'd rather pineapple peach commentary sometimes. For that. Don't you think? Sounds like something the pineapple peach would do. That's totally yes. Yeah, if you make augmented reality apps for Apple, Android, uh, <laughs> use content when you're allowed to use. You don't want to. You don't want to. You don't want a lawsuit. You'd be surprised what happens in the rights holders. So make sure you get your rights holders all in the center of the row. Right, Gabe? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so with augmented reality apps, you can make apps that. You know, like 3D images that interact with your environment in, in your phone view, or or apps that can recognize certain shapes and uh, pulls up information and triggers actions. Now, the most that most people actually know augmented reality, and the first one would actually be Pokemon Go. This was most people's initial interaction with augmented reality because you're catching Pokemon in the real world, you're interacting with Pokestops, including. My personal favorite by me, if those who can read it, it says huge package. And now, but these things also allow you to do other things because they're all about health, fitness, discovery. In a way, you yourself are becoming the controller and interacting with the world around you. Like, you will go exploring, find exploration, and do even more. Now, Pink and Bloom didn't take off as much as Pokemon Go, but this is where another one comes in of everyone knows Digimon. Now you'll actually go around and it'll even track your stats, allow you to do digivolutions and everything like that. You can see this within the Vital Hero Digimon app itself, and it in and of itself is a wearable that you would wear as a more or less digivice. And they call it the Vital Hero Digimon, obviously. 
and a new one actually released two days ago. This actually leads into things such as Zombies Run. Now this in and of itself is more gamification aspects for health, fitness, and doing things, for the collecting of resources as you go around and run. They have immersive narratives that allows you to do things. They are even doing things with completely voiced over narrations and interactive elements so that it becomes part of a story so that you in and of itself are becoming the game and the game is becoming part of your world as you're going around. Now this leads into other ways to interact which we've covered a bit before, such as scannables. So this is a thing that allows to make sure that people can go directly inside assets because people, URLs can be long, errors can be made, shadow bans are also real if anyone's familiar with that from Instagram or sometimes even Twitter. You can scan, it can go direct. But this leads to what people are really looking for and is starting to happen, which is VR immersion. Because this is what you see here with the holodeck is that would be the end goal for any type of VR immersive technology. And you're getting closer there, where you have things for haptic response, interactions, environments that engage all your senses in one way or another. But that's where it's actually going to be leading to. So let's talk about what's actually happening now with immersive experiences. Now, who's familiar here with the arcade show? Arcade, arcade show. Yeah. Now, they actually had an installation that was you could actually be part of that world, and they did, had cosplayers there as well. So you can see Max and Claire, OMG Chomp, and you can see they were all part of something that was actually happening. So you can interact with the characters and environments and things like that. You can also see this from everything when you go to like Disney and other immersive experiences where you have like people who are becoming part of the world, part of games, etc. So it becomes an environment in which you live in. Then you can add on to this different things with haptic feedback and AR and VR technology, as you can see here from the Monster Hunter Iceborne VR walk, where you can hunt with a couple weapons, can't do all 14, but you can go in and actually fight a Volcano. That's that rather icy looking Rory Dragon right there, and you can actually fight that dragon as if you were hunting inside Monster Hunter with an actual immersive environment. So you have the augmented reality through the VR headset while you're actually in a secondary reality that will help engage your other senses more than just sight and sound. Because you'll feel most of the things you'd be fighting if you'd actually be fighting a Volcana. Most people, if you're actually fighting a real Volcana, it's actually somewhat dangerous to make sure to consult your doctor before attempting to fight a Volcana. So let's go into something that's going to be as part of our next topic, is that everything can be a scannable, including yourself. Now, if you're familiar with motion capture, this in and of itself is a way to make you as a part of the game. People will capture things, and then it will allow it to be interactive, created as a game asset, or then in and of itself, be able to have you be able to interact. You see this from like the interaction that takes in from VR technology, or from VTubing, because the characters will move and flow, so you in and of yourself can be a game character, your best anime waifu and husbando, and do it. Yeah, and then you see that people have the recognition of items as people because you can be yourself or you can be whatever you want to be. This assists in cosplay making, and again, it can take the assets and then what it can do is then turn them in available for cosplay use. Now, many companies such as Riot and others provide cosplay references. Now, next up, this leads into uh, Angel, who is unfortunately unable to make it uh, this weekend. Now, Angel is a cosplayer of many years. She's worked with many different companies. Make sure you follow Angel on her Instagram for all sorts of wonderful content. As you can see, that's Angel right here as Lulu from Final Fantasy. Okay, let's talk about uh, making video game cost costumes. How's that different from the 2D kind? Well, here's the thing. is There's not always a lot of difference, at least in terms of some aspects of elements. Because all things in this nature start off as a 2D format. You can see here where the character reference sheet for D.Va, which you can also expand into the next slide. You can see they actually have color references of everything that you'd want to do. Ways to lay out the character so in here we see both D.Va and also the writer Shogun from Genshin. You can see they took the game assets, which are 2D, 3D, and then basically broke it down, and then you can see one of the things from the major uh, cosplay makers, you know, the system make costumes, ubu costumes, doki doki, etc. So they break it down to the different types, and using like the breakdown from video game assets, we're to see how that can be translatable into various different types of cosplay. And then what you do is you try to 
see what type of materials could use depending on what you wanted to do. Such as certain things would be better made if they were made out of spandex. Certain things would be better if they were made out of latex if you wanted to do like a particular shine. Or if they did for like different things for stretchability, mobility, etc. But the whole big thing is about having fun with it if you're cosplaying it, because you could take even some of these models, upload them to Spoonflower, or even like a custom Zentai maker, that's a bodysuit, and then be able to like print that out so you can wear it. You've seen many uh, bodysuit cosplays around this weekend, so it's like taking those kind of things and then being able to put it in a way that would fit along the lines of a standardized kind of set of human measurements to do it for a mass produced media. Now, when you do it individually, you can break that up to different things. So let's keep uh, continuing on. Now, uh, you'll see in the next slide that this is some of the text from Angel that she created the Red Phoenix Mercy for each thing. Now, if there's more types of prop files and things that are be able to use, you'll be able to do greedy designs, and then other people can do interpretations of a character. So you'll see these different kinds of things because it goes down to what makes a character a character. And then you can have very abstract interpretations. You can like loot up a character that you commonly see on like, somebody's OnlyFans. Or you can play something very literal, like the original Tomb Raider with pointy boobs. Uh, triangle boobs are the epic squall meme. So you can see Angel in some of our other cosplays. You can see Angel uh, Mercy from the one of the skins from Overwatch, as well as from League of Legends Katarina. And then next up, you can see some of the different things here. The swell meme of you're the most handsome guy here, a looted up version of Pyramid Head, as well as the triangles from Lara Croft. Okay, so earlier we talked about augmented reality and virtual reality. And, uh, well, you can actually start being an augmented reality, virtual reality developer. All you gotta do for, for mobile devices like iPhones, Androids, so as yes, Google makes their Android development tools available, so does Apple. In fact, I can show you what a app looks like when you make it. I have a basic, I have, so yeah, when you program, it's, big, it's not speaking another language. It's pretty much doing research, and I found this basic uh, museum app. See? Okay, here we have the Mona Lisa. All right, and we, we, have, we have our uh, augmented reality uh, well, assets imported, okay, of course. Uh, and here's where we program, you know, we get the image name, the title, information about the Mona Lisa, and, and the image name again. And when you make, and this is Xcode, which was what Apple makes available. So yes, that's kind of what a, that's a, this is a very basic augmented reality app, and I, and I expanded upon that with the uh, uh, museum. And you can do that too. <laughs> All right, uh, so how do you be a mobile developer? Well, if you, well, it helps to go to college and take classes. That does cost a lot. I also recommend go to your local bookstore, buy those programming books, the most updated books on programming for iOS, programming for Android, uh, iOS you program in Swift. Uh, they used to do Objective-C, but it's more, mostly Swift now. Uh, Android, if you know Java and XML, uh, you're set. Now get one of those books. Then you can move on to, then you can move on to make an augmented reality, you know, uh, apps and just do your research on that. Google is your friend and chat rooms and Stack Overflow. Okay, I think that covers it. Uh, when you have the ideas, you can make it happen. Because what it basically turns video games into reality is to have the ideas and the drive. So what you can do, you can make the bottle that drops like Max. It can be in a variety of mediums, including voicing the things that everyone wants to kill at the end of the game. You're pretty much voicing yourself in that interview with Ellen, right? Well, sometimes you have to do that, believe it or not. That's called uh, additional ABR recording. Yes, you dub yourself. And, mm -hmm. and then, uh, and then uh, again, you can end up turning things that can create and a mix of things. So you can take the things and create the mediums that can create the hard copies, make sure you pick your digital lizards and zoom up as well as turn it into other things that would be inspired and then put it back into creating the games themselves and the merged toys, animated series, and then who knows what next, right Gabe? This guy's the limit. Yeah. Exactly. This right. Game. Multiverse is the limit, doesn't it? The multiverse is the limit. Yeah, you, you, don't need to, you don't need to license your stuff for your comics. You do that yourself, right? What's that? Yeah, you're, this is pretty much all, you, you own all of this. I know some yes. musicians lend their likeness yeah. to uh, you know, some comics and games. This is all you. You're owning. You're owning this. Yeah, 100%. Okay. 
Well, so when you get that cartoons, uh, Nickelodeon has to come to you. <laughs> yes. Okay. Now, are there any questions? Get it forward. Oh, out of time. Okay. Sorry about that. We'll take questions. Yeah. We'll take you questions. Know, let's run it out yeah. Ask us outside. Right. Woo! I know the guy from Sherman is going to be here at 9. Uh, who's up?